so truly thankful, truly blessed to be able to be here this morning and truly be the blessing that we have life and health and that we are able to move about and to be able to come, that we can be together in one another's presence and that we're here for the sole purpose of worshiping God. It's so good to see those that we have not had with us for a while, Brother Looney especially, good to see him, others that we've not seen in this uh, service or so. Uh, Sister Melina, always good to see her. Uh, sorry that Sister uh, Mathis apparently is still not feeling well enough to be here. Good to see Brother uh, Gary, uh, Gary with us. Good to have the visitors that we have with us. And good to have those that may be watching either on the church's webpage, YouTube channel, or on the Facebook page. So we hope that we can study God's Word together and be benefited in having done so, and keeping those in our prayers that we need to remember, such as Sister Davis, uh, Brother Glenn's mother, who has double pneumonia, but she is at home, uh, surprisingly, but still remember her as well as others in our prayers. I would like for us in our study this morning to look at the subject of the paradoxes of the cross. And it may be that you're wondering exactly what is a paradox. Well, a paradox is a statement that seems contradictory, although it is a true statement. So, for instance, Christ came into the world. We know from 1 Timothy 1, verse 15, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief, the Apostle Paul says. In John chapter 18 and verse 37, Pilate therefore said to him, to Jesus, Are you a king then? Jesus answered, You say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. So truly, Jesus did come into this world. But as he came into this world, what we see is the paradox of this, is he came into the world that we might enter into heaven. In John chapter 14, verse 1 begins, Jesus said, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. We know, too, that he came in order that we might be in the heaven from Second Corinthians chapter 5. Or is in verse 1, for we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. So Jesus came into the world in order that we may enter into heaven. Another paradox is that we know that Jesus was born in the flesh. We know that from John 1. And verse 14, that uh, Rod read just a moment ago. And the word became, well, he, didn't, he read the verse 13. We're going to read verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So Jesus was born in the flesh. The word referring to Christ became flesh. And in First John 4, we read in verses 2 and 3 that by this we know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. 
So Jesus was born in the flesh. But the paradox is, he was born in the flesh that we may be born of the Spirit. In John 3 and verse 5, in the conversation that Jesus had with Nicodemus, he answered, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. It's in verse Peter that we read in verse 23 of chapter 1, that having been born to them, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. So Jesus was born in the flesh in order that you and I might have the ability to be born of the Spirit. We know, too, that Jesus was born of woman. In Galatians 4 and verse 4, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law. Isaiah prophesied in chapter 7 and verse 14, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. So truly, Jesus was born of woman. But the paradox is that while Jesus was born of woman, he was in order that we may be born of God. In John chapter 1, verse 11, he came into his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, To them he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. It's in 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. For whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. So Jesus was born to woman in order that you and I might have the opportunity to be born of God. We know, too, that Jesus accepted poverty. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9, he says, For we know that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you, through his poverty, might become rich. It's in Luke chapter 9, and in verse 58, Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Truly, Jesus accepted poverty when he came to this earth. But the paradox is that he accepted poverty in order that we might be rich. Going back to that verse that we looked at there in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9. Let's read it again. For we know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. Also, it's in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 7. It says that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. The riches that God showed, the riches that God had, he wanted to share with us, with you and I. Not the riches of this world that are subject to decay, like what Jesus said when he said, lay not up for yourselves treasure on earth where moth and rust corrupts and thieves break through and steal, but rather the riches that are true, that are genuine, that are, as we read a moment ago, that are in Peter, that are incorruptible, that are undefiled, that do not fade away. God's riches are those kind of riches. We must not focus upon the riches of this world, but focus upon the riches that God has manifested to us, and not just God but we see what Christ, his son. Christ was in heaven. He had all of the host of the angels 
That is Kamala. And then he became poor. He was a spirit, because that's what deity is. God is a spirit, John 4, verse 24. But Jesus gave up the totally spiritual person that he was and took upon himself flesh, as we read just a moment ago. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. In becoming flesh, he then subjected himself to all of the frailties of the flesh. He was despised and rejected. We're going to see about that in just a moment that Isaiah prophesied about. We already read that he came into his own and his own received him not. And he was tempted in all points like we are. He was rich. But he gave all of that up to come to this world that through him, through that sinless life that he was able to live, for which we need to give thanks for every day, that Jesus endured the frailties of the flesh, that Jesus endured, even, even being despised and rejected, don't you realize the temptation that's involved there? How do, how do we feel when we are despised? How do we feel when we are rejected by those that we would like to be received on. Isn't there a tendency, isn't there a temptation there to give up of our righteousness? What good does it do to continue to live right when all of these bad things are happening? That's sometimes the attitude that we have. And if being tempted in all points like we are in all of these things, he did no sin. So what a paradox. Jesus accepted poverty in order to enable you, to enable me, to have what he had before he came to this earth and what he descended and went back to because of his being in that poverty state, he enabled us to be rich. But also, as we said, Jesus was rejected of men. In John 1, we read just a moment ago, he came into his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, he gave to them the power right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name. And then there's that prophecy in Isaiah 53 and verse 3. He is despised and rejected by many. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hear as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Jesus was rejected of men. We know that. But the paradox is that as he was rejected of men, he did that in order that we may be accepted of God. In Ephesians 1, in verse 6, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he has made us accepted in the beloved. It's a matter not of our accepting Christ. Sometimes we hear that expression, accept Christ as your personal Savior. The real truth in the matter is, is whether or not we will conform ourselves to the will of God, that God will accept us. That's who the role of acceptance is upon. And that acceptance is on condition. We must do those things in order that we may be accepted of God. And then Peter made that statement as he entered to the house of Cornelius that in truth I perceive that God is no respect to a person. And for that we need to be thankful. It's just like that first verse that we read a moment ago in 1 Timothy 1 and verse 15, that Christ came into the world to save sinners, and Paul said, of which I am chief. We need to be thankful that God is no respect to a person, that regardless of our sin, 
whether we were up there with the apostle, well, whether we were down there with the apostle Paul being the chief of sinners, or whether we're somewhere in the middle, it's still God is no respecter of person. And when God forgives us of sin, our sins are truly indeed forgiven. He does not forgive our sins based upon our person. And we need to be thankful for that. But Jesus was rejected of men in order that we might be accepted of God. And we know that Christ was made sin for us. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Peter said in 1 Peter, the second chapter, verse 24 beginning, who, referring to Christ, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to God, who judges righteously, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sin, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you are healed. So many things that are said in those verses. As I said a moment ago, Jesus took upon himself flesh, all of the frailties of the flesh Jesus endured. He was despised and rejected, and that within itself is a source for temptation. He was tempted in all points like we are, but he committed no sin. There was the deceit found in his mouth. And it says when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. Isn't that sort of a tendency on our part? That when somebody reviles us, when somebody sort of chews us up and spits us out, that we become offended and that we retaliate? Or in the matter of when, when he suffered. When he suffered, he could have commanded those legions of angels to come because it's when we suffer that sometimes we, we seek to strike out, but not Jesus. When he suffered, he threatened not. But instead, done the one thing that is not so natural, humanly natural to do. He committed himself to God, knowing that God judges righteously. That was something that would do us well as we go down through this life and suffer the frailties of the flesh when we maybe are despised and rejected, when we face temptations, is to understand and realize that we're going to one day face a God, a judge that judges righteously. So truly, Jesus was made sin for us. But the paradox is, it was in order that we might be righteous of God. In 2 Corinthians 5, verse 1, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And then there's that statement in 1 John chapter 3, verse 7. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is just as he is righteous. But also, Jesus was put to death. In Luke 23, verse 46, And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, unto your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. We know too from Matthew chapter 16, verse 21, that from that time Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. Yes, Christ was put to death. But the paradox is that Christ was put to death that we 
may be made alive. In Colossians 2 and verse 13, and you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. That's only able to be accomplished, having forgiven all of our trespasses. That is only able to be accomplished through Christ's death, through the blood that he shed. And so it's in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1 that you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sin. Dead yet living. Living physically, our bodies not dead, but dead in the sense that we're separated from God. We know that death, James describes in James chapter 2, is when the body separates from the spirit. That when the body separates from the spirit, then the body is dead. But we also know that God gave the command in Genesis to Adam and Eve that the day that they ate of that forbidden fruit, they shall surely die. But yet we know that Adam continued to live on several hundred years after that event in Genesis 3. But that very day happened just exactly what God said would happen, and that is that he died spiritually. Sin separates from God. That's what we know from Isaiah chapter 59, verses 1 and 2. The Lord's hand is not short that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your sins have separated between you and your God, and your iniquity has hid his face from you that he will not hear. So we need to understand the kind of death that Jesus has saved us from, and that is the spiritual death that we can once again, though we sin, and every man does, every human sins, Romans 3, verse 23, so we're separated, we're dead. But Jesus has enabled us to be alive having forgiven us of our trespasses. And then two, Christ was cursed on earth. In Galatians chapter 3 and verse 13, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. Christ did no sin. We read that a moment ago. No guile in his mouth. When he was reviled, he reviled not again. When he was suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to God. He did no sin, but yet he became a curse for us. And how he did that is because of that statement that Paul mentions in Galatians 3 that's quoted in the Old Testament that anyone is cursed that hangs on to truth. What did they hang Christ on? They hung him on a tree. Christ became a curse for us. Not because of sin that he committed, but because of that statement in the Old Testament. And so Isaiah says in Isaiah chapter 53, verses 7 and 8, he was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet, he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shear is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living, for the transgression to my people he was stricken. You remember those mockeries of a trial? Jesus went through two of them. One was before, the first one was before the Jews. In the Jewish council, it was sometimes here referred to as the Sanhedrin. They brought him before that trial, and, and <laughs> the jury was already out on him before he ever got there. It was with the help of false witnesses that testified 
that they could only find the accusation, the statement that he made, and they made a misapplication of that statement. Yes, Jesus said, destroy this temple, and I will build it again in three days. And they knew full well that he was talking about his body, but for the sake of convenience, that's what they interpreted it to be on that day of the trial. Oh, he's going to destroy the temple, this physical building over here, and he's going to build it again in three days. And so they found him guilty of blasphemy. They took him before Pilate. And Pilate could find no fault in Jesus. And very quickly realized that the reason, the only reason in which they had brought Jesus to him was because of envy. The scribes, the Pharisees, the leaders of the people, the religious leaders of the people, they were envious of Jesus. As he was making disciples, they was losing their control. They were losing their power. And so envy set in, and Pilate recognized this and sought on a number of occasions to release Jesus. He even got to the point and said, okay, I'll, I'll punish him, and then I'll release him. And they said, no, you won't, is it? Crucify him. And again, Pilate would ask, why? For what reason? What, what law has he broken? Trials? Well, they went through the motions, but they were mockers of trials. And so no wonder Isaiah prophesied he was taken from prison and from judgment. He did not get a fair hearing before those to whom he came to save, but they received him not. So Jesus was cursed on this earth. But the paradox is, he was cursed that we might be blessed above. Galatians 3 and verse 4, that the blessings of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. I dare say that every one of us in this audience is a Gentile. I dare say that any of us claim Jewish ancestry. What this verse tells us is that in Jesus coming to this earth and going through the curse that he did, it enabled you and me as Gentiles to have the opportunity to be blessed in heaven. And one other verse, Revelation 14, verse 13. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Why? Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. So here's what we've seen in our study. The paradox of the cross. By no means all of them. Just a few. Things that seem to be contradictory, but yet they're true. And we need to be impressed with each and every one of them. That Christ came into the world that we may enter into heaven. That Christ was born in the flesh that we may be born in the spirit. That Christ was born of woman that we might be born of God. That Christ was willing to accept poverty in order that we might be rich. That Christ, while he was rejected of man, he did that in order that we might be accepted of God. We do not, we do not want to be rejected by God on that final day. Jesus was made sin for us that we might be the righteousness of God, that he was put to death, that we may be made alive, that he was cursed on earth, that we might be blessed above. Thinking of each and every one of these, what is your spiritual condition? Are you dead in your trespasses and sin? 
Do you not realize that if you go before God in the judgment, what the verdict will be? We're plainly told that well and good in the scriptures. And we need to be thankful for the scriptures because that's what they do. They tell us the things that are yet to come. And what is yet to come is judgment. And the purpose of judgment is for us to give an account of what you and I and every human being is responsible for. The Ecclesiastes writer said in Ecclesiastes 12, the whole duty of man or man's all is to fear God and to keep his commandments. That's what each and every responsible human being is to do here upon this earth. That's what we are responsible for. And in that responsibility, we need to know and realize that there is coming a day of accountability. We will give an account. There's no better description, I believe, of the judgment than what we find over in the book of Romans. If you will, and have your Bibles, as I hope you do, turn over there to Romans, the second chapter. It's in this chapter that we see what will be the standard that God will use in the judgment. Look at verse 2. And we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against those who commit such things. What is truth? Well, Jesus said in John 17, 17, God's word is truth. So see, that is going to be the standard that will be used in the judgment. Not my opinion, not your opinion, not what the opinion of the present day society that we might have lived in, what they considered right and wrong, none of that. The standard is going to be true, and God's word is truth. Then we see what's going to be set up and compared with that standard. Look at verse 6. Who will render to every man according to his deed. That will be the basis on what we will be judged. Our deeds will be compared with the standard. But then also, here's what we need to understand as well. Verse 11. For there's no respect of person with God. We're going to stand before an impartial judge. A judge that can't be fooled. A judge that can't be bribed. A judge that can't distinguish between truth and error. Or a lie that we're telling on our part. A judge that is completely and totally impartial. And notice the other thing. Verse 16. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. See, that tells me there's nothing I'm going to be able to hide. There's no secret that I'm going to be able to keep secret come the day of judgment. God's truth is the standard. My works will be the basis. God is impartial, but God knows and sees everything. Even the depths of my mind. Nothing is here. And we'll all stand before God. Second Corinthians 10 and verse 5. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. That we may live in account of the deeds that have been done in this body. Or that they be good or evil. So where do you stand before God? If you're dead in your trespasses and sin, look at what Christ has done. Look at what he has come to this earth to accomplish. If we are ones that have obeyed the gospel and yet we have lapsed into sin, there don't remain any more sacrifice for sin. But a fearful looking for of fiery indignation and judgment. It would have been better for us, Peter says, to have never known the way of righteousness 
than to have known it and turned from it. If you're here and you're not a Christian, you can repent of your sins, confess Christ to be the Son of God, and be buried with him in baptism, and his blood will cleanse you of your sins. If you're here and you've obeyed that gospel, but yet there's sin in your life, sin separates. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what the sin is. Sin separates. And as a child of God that has once obeyed the gospel, we can sin, but we need to repent of our sins. If necessary, confess our faults one to another, as James says in James 5, verse 16. And do as Peter told Simon, repent and pray that perhaps the thoughts of your heart be forgiven. So if we can assist you to either of these ends, please take time and opportunity now while you know you have it and come and have a seat at the front while together we stand to sing.